Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Awaken the Spirits. Yeah. One of the biggest events of the season is on its way back to Los Angeles this year. Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood. Fans everywhere are holding their breath in anticipation as Universal pulls back the curtain, revealing the monsters that will be lurking in the darkness this year. Our next guest is fresh off the plane from Ireland. It's his first time back to Los Angeles since 2019. Please welcome to the stage the one, the only, John Murdy. Wouldn't it be wouldn't it be cool if I did that and like I didn't have a mouth or something? <laughs> wow, this is this is the most people I've seen in one place in like two years. How are you guys doing? Well, um, I'm John Murdy. I am the creative director, executive producer of Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood. And today, um, what I thought I'd do for everybody is I'd give you a deep dive, deep dive, into one of the mazes that we're doing for this year's event. Uh, I brought along a lot of goodies, stuff that nobody has seen. <laughs> stuff that nobody has heard. Um, I thought we'd also maybe, um, maybe make an announcement. That's cool. But before we do any of that, Just, there's something we gotta do, okay? Last time I saw you guys, right? It's been two years. This is where we left off. That moment when everybody got the word that we weren't gonna be having Halloween Horror Nights in 2020, right? And I don't know about you guys, but this is how I felt. It's sad, I mean, do you remember? It just was heartbreaking, and I'm sure each and every one of you, there's nothing that myself and, and my partner, Chris Williams, my art director, production designer, and everybody who works on the Halloween Horror Nights team, you know, we, we've always said this, we do it for you guys, we do it for the fans. Um, so initially it felt like this, and then eventually it felt like this. <laughs> and I think, you know, we need to exercise those feelings right now. So what I need you to do, each and every one of you in the audience, we need to do a primal scream just to get it out of our system. Don't you feel like you need to do that? I know I do. All right, let's do it on three. One, two, three. Ah! Feels better. And then eventually, as the year went on, it felt like this. <laughs> and you know, that day, that day, that particular day in 2020, I went on Twitter first thing and I wrote a bunch of stuff. I don't know if you guys remember it or not. And what I kept saying is, the monster always survives. Right? Because if you guys know me, I'm a huge Universal Monster fan. And actually, 2020 would have been the 50th year of me being a Monster fan. Because that was when I started, when I was just four years old. And um, to me, it was like the Universal Monsters. It was like Frankenstein, you know? Every movie, something terrible happens to him. Like, you know, getting kicked in the chest and falling into a pit of flaming sulfur. Um, but there's one thing I know from all of those films, and that is no matter what happens at the end of the movie, the monster always survives. Right? And that's what I told you guys on Twitter back in 2020, right? I said, I know this is terrible, it's heartbreaking, everybody feels it, but the monster is going to survive. Halloween Horror Nights is that monster. It's the monster that each and every one of the people who work on our team, all the men and women, have created over the years. It's a monster that we share with all of you, the fans who've supported this event year after year after year. Um, and the monster has survived. So today, I'm gonna be taking you guys through a maze we call Universal Monsters, The Bride of Frankenstein Lips. And of course, this is inspired by Universal's 1935 classic monster movie, The Bride of Frankenstein. In fact, it is a sequel to The Bride of Frankenstein. 
Um, but before we dive into the maze itself, there's always a backstory, okay? Uh, and this is gonna share with you a little bit about where I'm coming from, how I you know, got into the Universal Monsters, and everything that led into this moment that we're in right now, which is the last you know, three years of Horror Nights, bringing back the Universal Monsters and making them a signature part of our event. So I grew up as a Universal Monster kid, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this before. That's me, that's my fourth birthday, and what's next to me, it's the old Aurora Monster Models. Um, my mother made the mistake of showing me Frankenstein when I was four years old, and uh, the story in my family goes that when she came back into the living room, I was crying my eyes out, and then when she got to talk to me, she realized that I wasn't afraid of Frankenstein. I just felt so damn sorry for him. <laughs> well, it's the truth. I mean, if you think about the movie Frankenstein, he didn't ask to be born, right? He was stitched together from different body parts, dug out of a grave, and then jolted to life electricity, and then kicked out into the world, right? And asked to deal with it. And everywhere in that film, he's looking for the same thing. Friend, friend. And everywhere he goes, he's met with hatred. Men with pitchforks and flaming torches. And um, so I just instantly sympathized with the monsters, and that's the beginning of becoming a Universal Monster fan. Now, in the 70s, it was kind of a golden age for these movies, right? Um, they were back on television. I don't know if anybody in the audience will remember this, but Seymour's Monster Rally, right, on KTLA, every weekend they would run the Universal Monster movies, and that's how I saw all the movies. And there was also great magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland um, that had the monsters front and center. And it really was kind of like a renaissance for the monsters in that period. There were toy products. These are the Mago Mad Monsters. There were Super 8 movies that you could watch in your own living room, like the Bride of Frankenstein movie there. Um, but kind of paramount above everything was the Aurora Monster Models, right? Um, when they released those monster models, um, I had every single one of them. And I meticulously built them all, and I painted them. And then one fourth of July, my two older brothers blew them all up with firecrackers. <laughs> and destroyed them. If you guys know anything about the Aurora Monster Models, you know, a, a kit from that era is worth about 1500 bucks now. Which I constantly remind my brothers of. Um, the monsters seem to be everywhere. And my favorite Aurora Monster Model, and I'll go on record today as saying this was the Bride of Frankenstein, right? And that's kind of the genesis for this maze, right? How many of you have seen the Bride of Frankenstein? Okay. You know what's weird about that movie? How long is she in the movie? She's like five minutes at the end. It's like, hey, she's born. Oh no, Frankenstein's pulling the switch and blowing up the castle. And she's gone and she never comes back. Not like Dracula or the Wolfman or the Mummy. She's in one movie and that's it. Um, but I love this model and it was my favorite model. So I've always had a special you know, place in my heart for the bride. Now, Halloween, of course, was the time to dress up as Universal Monsters. The costume choices were limited in those days. That's me as Frankenstein. That's me as Super Wolfman next to my brother dressed as the hippie. And uh, that's me as the mummy with blue uh, tennis shoes on. And then I learned that there was this place called Universal Studios Hollywood. And you could go there and you could actually meet the monsters. That's actually me grabbing onto that poor guy playing the Wolfman's hand. <laughs> I probably followed this guy all over the park, you know, all day long. Wolfman, would you just... And the guy's just like, oh God, when's my break? You know? And that's me at Movie Land Wax Museum in their, in their Chamber of Horrors, if you guys remember Movie Land. So the monsters, you know, the theme parks with a connection from the movies to actually seeing the monsters in the flesh. Um, and this is some old Universal Studios Hollywood history. I don't know how many of you guys remember this. But the Universal Monsters, from the minute the theme park opened, which was when the studio tour, the tram started, 1964, the monsters were always kind of front and center. Um, this is a picture I found in, in my archive of old images of Universal. Uh, the guy with the axe, that's actually Jack Pierce. That's the man who did the makeup for all of the classic monster movies from the 1930s and into the 40s. And as part of the tour in the early days, in the 60s, um, you could get made up by the Westmore family, right? Those are the guys who did Creature of the Black Lagoon and countless other movies. And that was all part of the studio tour. Then they opened this show. It was called Land of a Thousand Faces. Does anybody remember that? It was 1975 to 1979. Great, I'm the oldest person in the room. <laughs> Um, but what it was, it was a makeup show. It's, if you go to the theme park today, special effects stage, that's the same place, that's where it was held. And they would take a guy and a girl out of the audience and they would make them up to be Frankenstein, or the monster, and the bride of Frankenstein. And then 
they actually had a wedding ceremony apparently at some point and it's really interesting if you look at these pictures that's Forey Ackerman the guy who ran Famous Monsters magazine standing off to the side it appears that the wolf man is the monster's best man and I think that's a vampire bride as the maid of honor and then there's a gorilla because why not the gorilla was actually, he was the mascot of the Animal Actors Show. I've, I found all these old pictures of him running around the Animal Actors Show. But they had a wedding ceremony, and then the next thing that happened, of course, is a child came along. I don't know if anybody remembers this. This is Frankenstein Jr. He was a character that you used to see at the theme park back in the early days of Universal. And then after Castle Dracula, or after uh, Land of a Thousand Faces came Castle Dracula, which was a much more elaborate show. And it had all the monsters and it had the Bride of Frankenstein as well. So she was always the through line. She was there from the beginning of the days, the earliest days of the park. This is another picture of Castle Dracula, same theater that I mentioned earlier where SES is today. What's interesting is if you see the picture with Dracula pointing, if you see that gargoyle, we still have that. Have you guys seen that show up in scare zones and mazes over the years? That's actually from Castle Dracula. It's been in our inventory for years and years and years. And Frankenstein became like the unofficial mascot of the studio tour. Here he is posing with Alfred Hitchcock. And even at Christmas, they tried out Frankenstein. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. It's Frankenstein, a goat, and the cockatoo from the TV show Beretta, if I'm, if I'm right about this. So Frankenstein always had a presence and the monsters always had a presence in the theme park. So when I got to a, a place where I could start creating and producing my own stuff, I, my mission in life was always to bring the monsters back to Universal Studios Hollywood, back in the old days with House of Horrors, the walkthrough attraction we had, and, and everywhere, every project I did, I tried to find a way to squeeze the monsters into it. But honestly, I resisted doing them at Horror Nights for many, many, many years. And honestly, I just didn't know how that would be received. And that's the reason we didn't do it going back to the oldest days. You know, we didn't do the first Universal Monsters proper maze until 2018. Um, because I love these characters so much that like, I was just terrified that if we did something and you guys didn't dig it, I would just be crushed. That would be it. I would just walk off into the sunset. Um, but luckily that didn't happen. Uh, Universal Monsters 2018 was by far one of the fans' most you know, favorite mazes of all times. Um, there's the PR. And the Bride of Frankenstein had a role in this maze as well. In, in the 2018 maze, we had the idea that Dr. Frankenstein was in such a hurry because as you were going through the maze, you went and saw all the villagers out in front of the, the ruined um, castle with their pitchforks and torches. So he's in a hurry. He's trying to assemble the Bride of Frankenstein, but he's running out of time. So we did her as a disassembled creature, which looked like this. Um, and people, you know, in, in this era of multiverses, <laughs> I just have, you know, people are always asking me, they're like, so, you know, when you, you had it all planned out, exactly, you know, how this all was going to work with the Universal Monsters, and I'm like, no. <laughs> I was, I had the first one planned, and then I had a vague idea that we would do Frankenstein meets the Wolfman in the next year, if the, if the first one was successful, but that's as far as we planned it. We didn't plan it very far. Um, so, in 2019, we did Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And the bride had a role in this maze as well. Um, the idea here is that the castle burned down and she was completely torched. So now she was still alive, but she was a disassembled, charred to the bone, you know, corpse. And this proves that we didn't have a multiverse. <laughs> because now we have, the bride of Frankenstein lives! And somebody asked me early on, they're like, well, what are you going to do? Because, you know, in your last maze, she was charred and she was lying on the table, you know, disassembled. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> Horror movies don't work like that. You can, you know, blow up Michael Myers at the end of Halloween 2 and he comes back just fine. So, this is how she looked in uh, Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman in 2019. But now the legacy continues with The Bride of Frankenstein Lives. And I am very, very proud to say that once again, our good friend Slash is doing an all new original score for this maze. Um, would you like to hear something? Yeah. Now watch this, <laughs> I'll jinx myself and then it won't work. But yesterday was Friday the 13th, right? Good. Okay, 
if you wouldn't mind, I'll click to the next slide. We're just going to preview one of the tracks that he's doing right now. Um, this is for the very, very beginning of the maze. Let me see if this works. Just a little taste of one of the pieces of music that Slash is doing. You know, it's <laughs> cool. So it's funny, he, he texted me like just like maybe 45 minutes ago, and he's like, he's on the road with Guns N' Roses. I don't even know what town he's in. And he's like, How's it going? How's it going? You know, what's happening? And I'm like, Yeah, hey, I'm about to talk about the bride. So he, he said to say hi to everybody. Nicest man in the world. Um, the, the, the cool thing, like, even though last year everything that happened and, and everybody in lockdown, that guy was constantly, constantly texting and checking in. How are you doing? Are you okay? Um, we're so honored to have him back and working with us again. It's been such a great collaboration. Um, well, let's talk about, like, the idea behind this maze. So, you know, obviously there's the movie we talked about, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935, how she's only in, like, five minutes or so of that film, and then she gets blown sky high when the monster says, we belong dead, pulls the switch. Um, and to give credit where credit is due, this idea actually originated um, with our sister park in Universal Orlando. Uh, we are always talking on the phone and comparing notes, and when we were talking about what we might mutually want to do with the monster franchise moving forward, um, one of their designers, and his name's Patrick Brailliard, um, a really talented designer, Patrick had the initial idea for this and some of the other folks in Orlando as well. And immediately Chris and I were like, we're in, this is a great idea. We love the idea of taking um, a female character, because you know, when you look back in horror history, especially you know some of the older films, there's not a lot of, great female monster characters. The Bride is one of the most iconic ones there is, and she's in it for like this much. And we thought, 
she deserves her own story. She deserves her own maze. This is the year of the female monster across the board. Across the board. Um, so, um, as we started to get into this, we had the challenge, of course, if you're telling an original story, which this is, this is, this is us creating a sequel, um, you know, that never existed. In, in essence, that's what it is. Um, so you have to think about how you do that storytelling-wise in the context of a maze, because a maze is a lot different than a movie uh, or a TV show. We can't just stop and do, you know, a bunch of dialogue in the middle of it. You know, it's loud. It's a chaotic environment. Um, so uh, early on, as Chris and I started talking about this, I kept coming back to Mary Shelley's book, you know, from, I believe, 1918, when she wrote the original Frankenstein, which actually included the bride in it. Um, it is part of the book. Um, and I thought, well, this would be cool if this was like, you know, a, a book that came out later that nobody knows about. Um, and the other thing that was a big inspiration is an artist named Bernie Wrightson. Do you guys know who Bernie Wrightson is or was? Um, Bernie Wrightson was this amazingly talented illustrator um, that I had the pleasure of working with in my career at one point. And he did an illustrated version of Frankenstein years ago. Um, and if you get a chance, do yourself a favor and buy this book and check it out. You will never see more beautiful drawings than what Bernie created for this book. Um, so we wanted to kind of combine that idea of a book. And what you're looking at, this is the actual facade for the maze. We created a giant old Victorian book that's open to the title page. And the reason it's a little bit off-center on the, on the side where you see the black and white images is because the door is in the middle. Um, so we wanted the, the book open to the title page. Um, a lot of books from this era, they would always have this type of you know, layout and artwork. Um, so we you know, wanted you to literally walk into the story. And we wanted to use that idea of a book or chapters as a reoccurring transitional element that we would, you know, that you'd encounter as a guest as you walk through the maze, both with imagery, with pictures, with a little bit of writing, and also with voiceover, because in this maze, the bride talks. Just like Frankenstein learned to talk by the Bride of Frankenstein in The Bride of Frankenstein Lives, the bride has learned to talk. And what she's doing is she's telling you this story. And it's probably years, you know, it's much, 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 you know, more into the future. And she's telling the story about what happened. And you're getting to hear that narration as you go through the maze along with the images of the book. So let's zoom in for a closer, and by the way, this is by a very talented artist named Lucas Colshaw. Did you guys go through Holidays in Hell in 2019? Right. Okay, all those amazing postcards and images, the nursery paintings in the nursery scene, that's all Lucas Colshaw. Lucas has been with Chris and I since the very beginning. He's always been our illustrator who does all the character drawings. So we turned Lucas loose, you know, for this maze to do original artwork. So this is the title page. And I'm going to zoom in on this because I just think, I want this on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody make a t-shirt of this for me. Um, very much in that same kind of line art style that Bernie did years ago. But that's, uh, that's Lucas's, it's, that's what you'd call a cameo. In Victorian you know, era, there was a lot of paintings that were like this. There were a lot of photographs that were done like this. So this is Lucas's version of a cameo. And if you look at it real close, you get all the little details that relate to the story. Um, there's an Easter egg. <laughs> So when we did this illustration, um, Lucas and Chris and I were talking, we're like, God, I feel like something's missing. It just feels kind of empty on the bottom. And, I, and Lucas goes, well, you know, in those days, they would always list the publishers. So I went, oh, OK. <laughs> so we can have some fun with this. So it's printed in London, um, printed for Williams. It's Chris Williams. Yeah. Colshaw, that's Lucas Colshaw. I didn't feel good about putting my last name up there. <laughs> it just felt wrong, so I changed it to Murdoch. It didn't sound English enough. Um, and then Hudson, that's an inside reference to our good friend Slash, that's his real last name. Um, and then Quinnelty is a gentleman named Stacy Quinnelty who works with Slash and um, does all of the, uh, or you know, produces all of those tracks that you're hearing. That's also Stacy's work. And he does all of, he's in charge of all of the audio for the mazes as well. Um, and then there's the illustration. So this moment captures the, the end of Bride of Frankenstein, 1935. We belong dead. The monster has just thrown the switch. The explosion's gone off. The castle is starting to crumble. And you can see the bride in the distance. But then when you go into the maze, well, I'll back up for a second. I mentioned the bride speaks. 
So in her voice, we hear her out front as you're waiting to go inside. She says, my story begins where his story ended, but monsters never truly die. Um, so the first thing you see once you walk through the book is the prologue page, which is this image. And the, the explosion has happened, the bride has survived, because she's a monster, she can do that. Um, but the monster has been trapped underneath all this rubble, huge beams have fallen from the ceiling, they've... Whoop, somehow we jumped like three slides. Do you want to manually go back or you want me to... There we go, one more. One more back, there you go, thank you. It's probably my fault, I probably touched it. Um, and his legs are completely shattered, um, and she sees him, and, it, and the prologue is called Something Survived, and then she has to make a decision. So, oh, the power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. There we go. <laughs> I won't touch it. I'll leave it right here. Um, so she has to make a decision, and the decision is, does she save the monster or not? And she decides to save him, and the reason is because, even though she got a little freaked out and screamed at him, um, he's the only one in her short, short life that showed him any kindness. So she decides that she has to save him. So this is the first time she finds a voice and says something. You see that prologue image, then you walk inside and then we reproduce that scene three-dimensionally for you. You see the monster trapped underneath the huge pillars and the bride is trying to free him and she screams primally and the scream turns into the word dead. So the monster is almost devoid of life at this point. The next chapter is called Saving the Monster and at this point you see the bride and she's got the monster over her shoulder and she's carrying him through the woods. You can see the smoldering castle away in the distance, but you see something else in the foreground. You see three figures. And then the bride in this scene, she goes through four different costume iterations and some makeup iterations throughout the course of this maze because we're telling this story of her adventure from going from the beginning, or I should say the end of Bride of Frankenstein to her assuming the role as doctor at the end of the maze. So each of these iterations has a different wardrobe touch. So this is her traveling cloak look. You can see by her costume that she's, you know, the whole one side of her costume is badly burned in her face. She's got this horrible scar from the fire. And she says, I had to save him, but the world outside the castle walls was full of monsters. And what monsters is that? The Brides of Dracula from 1931. So hovering around the outside of the castle are the Brides of Dracula. Now we've done the Brides of Dracula. We did them in 2018 for the Universal Monsters Maze. So we're, we're basically treating them like the 31 film where there's three of them. They're almost like sisters, although each of them is going to have a, a distinct look. So one of them will have red hair and one of them will have blonde hair and one of them will be a brunette. Um, but they're all going to be taking off from what we started in 2018. Um, and the bride has to get the monster somewhere. And she doesn't know where she is, she's lost in the woods, but she comes across the ruins of an old cottage that's completely ravaged by fire. And it's a throwback, and there's a couple of throwbacks in this maze, nodding back to 1935 and the classic film Bride of Frankenstein. This is the old blind man's cottage, but he's long gone. It's a charred wreck, as you remember at the end of that scene, it all caught on fire and Frankenstein went running. So she takes the monster here. This is her sanctuary, initially. And if you remember that scene with the old man in Bride of Frankenstein, there's that, that great scene where he puts him, he lets him go to sleep in his bed and he's praying and there's a cross up on the wall if you remember that scene from the movie. So this is one of Chris's illustrations, um, an elevation for the scene where we come in, the monster is laid out on the bed, devoid of life. Um, the cross is missing. You see the burnt imprint of it on the wall. The Bride of Frankenstein is using the cross, so she's trying to protect the monster and then the vampire brides come busting in and she uses the cross to repel them because vampires don't like crosses. And we're building this special effect hand prop cross that has like burning embers in it and everything so she can activate it when she does her action in the scene. Um, but then she takes that cross and she sharpens the ends of it and turns it into a cross slash stake. And her next iteration is Vampire Hunter. So as the story goes on, 
the Bride of Frankenstein is constantly being pursued by these vampires, and so she becomes, in essence, a vampire hunter. The name of this chapter is The Hunted Becomes the Hunter. And here you can see her, and she's all vampire monstered out. In fact, this is her yeah. costume. So she's got like a leather bandolier with all of these little cross stakes that have been sharpened into, you know, into vampire stakes. Um, she still has the remnants of her original gown, but it's been shortened. And each, each time we see her, she takes a different step forward onto her journey of becoming empowered and becoming the doctor. And in this point, she says, I hunted them and others like them across the land and across the years, for they held the secret to eternal life. So the Bride of Frankenstein in this maze is trying to figure out what she can do to bring the monster back. And she eventually realizes that the secret to life is in the blood of all these vampires, right? Because vampires live forever. They have eternal life. And like Dracula says in 1931, the blood is life. And so she realizes that she needs to harvest the blood of these vampires in order to bring the monster back to life. So there's a lot of killing that takes place at this point. Um, but we needed a place for her to go to once the cottage is overrun. Um, I think a lot of you guys know I, I don't live in this country anymore. I live in Ireland. I have for the last, since 2017. Um, one advantage to me living in Ireland and going back and forth is um, I, I'm always driving around. In, in Ireland, you could just turn a corner and it's like, oh, look at that you know, 800-year-old ruined church and taking pictures and I'm sending it to Chris all the time. I, I go to graveyards, go to graveyards a lot, take pictures of old graves and go, oh, this would be awesome for this scene. Um, this is an actual cathedral in Ireland in, in Dunluwy. Um, what I liked about it is it, other pictures you see of it, it's, it's like nature has reclaimed it. It's all covered in vines and it's been standing for, you know, centuries. So I gave this as inspiration to Chris because I said, well, if I was the bride and I'm being pursued by vampires and I need to take the monster to a, a sanctuary that the vampires aren't going to want to go into, it's going to be a church. So this is Chris's elevation of the front of the church all overgrown with vines. Um, and this is where one of the, uh, the first vampire bride or Dracula's bride uh, bites the dust. Uh, because the bride says, the world hated us, so we left the world behind, but evil soon followed. So even though she thinks she's safe in this church that she's going to turn into her new lab, evil still follows her. But she gets one of them. So these vampire brides have different iterations as well. Each one of them have three iterations. Uh, this is the staked look. So this particular bride has gotten a stake driven through her heart. She's bleeding out of every orifice on her face, her eyes, her nose, her mouth. Um, and her skin, in this case, is starting to burn and blister. Um, so that's the look of this character. And then when we get inside the church, we hit the next chapter of the story. It's called The Creation Becomes the Creator. Now the Bride of Frankenstein has assumed the role of Dr. Frankenstein. And she's, trying to, she's doing all these experiments. She's trying to figure out the secret to eternal life. She's trying to bring the monster back from the dead. Um, and there's all these vials and jars of blood. So she's harvesting the blood of these vampires and pumping it into the monster. And this is the illustration Lucas did for our doctor version of the bride. And when you first see her in the lab, because this, you know, we had a lab scene in 2018, and this time we went, let's do two lab scenes. Why not? So the first time you see her in the lab when she's got the monster on the table and he's still missing his legs and she starts pumping all this blood, she's literally draining it out of the, one of the vampires that she's caught and pumping it into the monster and there's boiling blood and there's you know, all of this different kind of lab equipment but it's a little bit more steam driven because we're a little bit more in the future. Um, Chris did another illustration. This is an elevation of it. It's a lot going on in there. It's a little bit hard to read. But you see the vampire bride with all these tubes hooked up to her, sucking the blood out of her. And you see that they're still in a church, but she set this place up like her lab. Also in this lab, as you get to the end of it, there's cages. And there's vampire brides in the cages. And it's the two other ones that we saw at the very beginning. Only now, the Bride of Frankenstein has been doing a lot of experimentation on them. Before she got around to figuring out, oh, it's the blood, she you know, did a lot of exploratory surgery. So one of them we call stitches, and one of them we call crosses. So stitches, she just cut open her head and was like, what's in here? This one's just part of her hair is missing and she's got stitches all over the place. And the other one was obviously just, she just didn't want to deal with her and went, like, stuck the cross up against her forehead. And, burned it in. Um, 
and this is where it gets dark, because <laughs> she's still a monster. As much as we're celebrating and saying we're empowering this character for the first time, she's a monster. Monsters do bad stuff. Um, she's captured all these vampires in order to drain the blood to bring the monster back to life, but that, you know, until you're ready to drain them, that means you gotta feed them. That means you gotta feed them blood, because that's the only thing the vampires subsist on. So there's a place called the feeding cages that you have to go through, and there's all these vampires in there, and bodies everywhere, and blood everywhere, and the vampires eventually break out. So on the night she's going to bring the monster back to life, she's got a problem. There's still two vampires running around trying to get her. Now this part, as we go under the church and we're in the catacombs, this is very much inspired by the catacomb scenes from The Bride of Frankenstein. Specifically this gate. Chris always like focuses in on a particular detail, and he, he must have liked this gate, because when I looked at his uh, elevation for it, I was like, oh, he's doing the gate, he's doing the catacombs. Um, so you're gonna be going underneath here, you go through the feeding rooms, you go deeper into the catacombs, and it's kind of a cat and mouse game at this point between the bride and the vampire brides. But another one bites the dust. The Stitches meets her end in this section. She gets staked through the heart. And the bride has a great line in this. The, the vampire brides are getting cocky at this point and they're doing their snake-like voices saying, you know, you know, we live for, we're immortal, we can't be killed. And you know, they're, they're taunting the bride. So when she <coughs> gets her, she says, the devil can have you back. And then we get to chapter five, which is called Live Again. And now it's the night that the Bride of Frankenstein is going to bring the monster back to life. So there's another second part of the lab, big, huge gurney. And now the monster has been fully reassembled. Well, maybe not fully reassembled. Um, and she gets to do the recall to Bride of Frankenstein to Dr. Pretorius's line, in the name of God, now I know what it feels like to be God. But this meant the monster needed a little bit of a revamp as well. This is the monster from our 2018 maze. That's the sculpt that Patrick McGee and McGee Effects did. And then that's the monster in the maze. So we kind of treated the monster kind of like how we treated the bride in 2018. She's in the middle of trying to reassemble him when these vampire brides crash the party. So she doesn't quite finish everything up. So she hasn't finished the top of his head, so his brain is partially exposed. Um, some of the electrical bolts have been replaced by catheters in places that you can hook up the blood. And we made him a stilt walker, so he's eight foot tall. <laughs> so when she put his legs back on, he got taller. So he's eight foot tall in this maze coming at you. And of course, once she flows the switch and brings him to life, it's, she gets to say the classic line from the original Frankenstein, it's alive. But there's still one more vampire out there. And this is Lucas's piece of artwork for the kind of coda at the end, chapter six, the monster reborn. I love how he reflected the, the image of the monster's hand coming to life in the glasses the bride is wearing. But there's still one more vampire out there. So before you get to the end of the maze, Crosses gets it. And that is the Bride of Frankenstein Lives. Now, all right. You want to see a little little sneak peek of what this maze is going to look like? Yeah. All right. Makeup test. Whoa. So this is a makeup test we just did this week. Um, uh, whenever we're doing makeup, prosthetic makeup, we always test it out first before we do it for real with the actors. So this is our bride character as the doctor um, with her full burn prosthetic. But wait. There's more. We get to the end of the maze. You know, this maze exits on French Street. Um, it just seemed natural to do a scare zone, kind of related to this whole thing. So we're doing Universal Monsters Silver Screen Queens. All right. So I said this was the year of the woman, the female monster, right? It's about time. Amen. Um, so we thought, it would be really cool to dig deep into the Universal catalog and find some female characters from the past that have probably never, you know, had stories like this told about them since the original films and do a female-centric scare zone that is the ending of the maze. So when you come out of this maze, you're going to see the bride triumphant as the doctor. You're going to see the still-walking Frankenstein's monster as well. But you're going to see 
uh, female archetypes of some of the classic universal monster characters, you know, mummy, werewolf, vampire. We call it Silver Screen Queens. And then in addition to this, as part of the, like, the decor of the scare zone, we thought it would be really cool to make trailers for each of these movies and the overall theme of the scare zone, um, but to try to do them in the style of those old 1930s and 40s trailers, right? So like this. Men run in fear, their courage vanishes, shrinking at the sight of the Silver Screen Queens. <laughs> Aksunam and the Mummy, the She-Wolf of London, and Dracula's Daughter. Okay, so that means we had to design new characters, right? So there's more than I'm gonna show you, because we're doing some, we're doing, some of them are gonna be in traditional makeup and some of them are gonna be masked characters. So we're doing both for each character. So there's kind of like a young version of the Mummy, um, that's a little bit more like Ardeth Bay, if you know that character that Boris Karloff played in the 1932 Mummy movie. And then there's ones that are like, like they just popped open, you know, the sarcophagus after 2,000 or 3,000 years, and it's all decrepit. And this is the decrepit version of Aksu Naman. Now, who is that character? In history, that is the princess of King Tut. But in monster history, 1932, that is the woman that Boris Karloff's character is trying to resurrect. That's the princess he wants to bring back to life. So we brought her back to life as part of the scare zone. And of course, she gets her own trailer from the banks of the Nile, from the tomb of the Valley of the Kings. And you won't hear me doing this. Rises Egypt's Queen of Terror, Easter Egg, Universal Monsters Maze, <laughs> Aksunam and the Mummy. So this is all playing in the scare zone, but we're also doing female vampire character. We're gonna do a traditional makeup one, but we're also doing this one uh, that looks something like this. And this is inspired by Dracula's Daughter, which is an actual universal movie from the late 1930s. So here's a little bit of the fake trailer for Dracula's Daughter. I just watched a whole bunch of old trailers one day and just had to, well, I'll just write a bunch of trailers. And then there's the werewolf character, She-Wolf of London. We're gonna do this both as a full prosthetic makeup, uh, like mid-transformation, and then a fully transformed one. So this is the uh, prosthetic version. And here's her trailer. And there's no audio in this because Slash is providing that. He's doing a whole piece just for the scare zone as well. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we're doing with that scare zone. All right. Okay. So, it seems like we should maybe wait, make a little bit of an announcement. Is there anything you guys are waiting to hear about? Frequent fear package. There will be things coming in, in the days ahead, things that may have something to do with what you're talking about, but they should be coming in, in mere days ahead. But what I wanted to talk about was the fact that this is coming back. <laughs> Terratron is gonna return for Halloween Horror Nights 2021. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you the theme today, Whoa. Sorry. Sorry. Got it. You got it. You know. You just gotta give little crumbs until we get a little further along, and then we'll be there. But we did want to be able to tell you. I actually asked for permission. I'm like, can I just tell them the terror tram's coming back? Because I'm so tired of being asked that question like constantly. So yes, terror tram is going to be a part of Horror Nights 2021. You know, it wasn't there in 2019. A lot of you. <laughs> A lot of you told us you wanted it back, right? We do listen to the fans, so it's back. And now we have to do some fan appreciation, okay? So, I brought with me this. I'll read it. Take my glasses off to read it. 15 years, man. <laughs> 15 years of Horror Nights. Not everything works. 
Congratulations, you are invited to experience Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood with two complimentary Universal Express tickets, including event admission. Well, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> here's some front of line tickets, but we're not going to include the admission. Here, have fun. <laughs> including event admission. Well, I guess you have to spell it out. And, and an exclusive behind the scenes maze tour with presumably me. <laughs> so, what we do this every time, it's a tradition of Midsummer Scream. We ask a trivia question, right? I pick randomly the first person I see, and you can't see anything if you're up here, you know, all you see is lights. So, um, I pick somebody, they have to answer the question. If they get it correct, they will win two Universal Express tickets, including admission, <laughs> and an exclusive behind the scenes tour with yours truly. Um, for Halloween Horror Nights. So, before I do this, though, there's something we absolutely have to do, and that is to say, oh, that hurts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, you know, 2020 was tough. It was tough. I'm sure it was tough for all of you, right? And Halloween was tough, you know? I mean, I, I was in Ireland, you know, I was just hoping to go trick-or-treating with the kids. That was, I, I, I'd gone from, you know, producing this wonderful event for all of you, you know, wonderful people, to I just hope I can go trick-or-treating with my kids, just maybe two houses, you know? And then that got canceled. So like, I did a haunted house in my house for two people. <laughs> <laughs> so desperate for anything, you know, Halloween. Because ever, as you can see from this presentation, ever since I was a wee lad, as they say in Ireland, um, you know, uh, Halloween's been my favorite time of year, and I'm sh I know you guys feel the same way. Um, but what it really brought home for me on a personal level, and I know I'm speaking for every single person at Universal um, and, and everybody who works on this event, is w when you don't have something that you love doing, man, do you miss it. And what you particularly realize is how grateful you are to each and every person who has supported this event. I mean, I said this is my 15th year, it should be 16th, but it's 15th, um, of doing Horror Nights, you know? And that is such an honor and a privilege to get to do that for all of you guys, to get to see people go through all of this work that everybody on this team works year-round nowadays, more than a year-round, as I've been working on 2022 for four months. Um, no spoilers, though. We will not be talking about that. Um, but you really realize just how, how important this community is of people that are like-minded people that love scary stuff, right? And when you guys weren't there, man, did we miss you. Um, so I just wanted to say on behalf of everybody at Universal, thank you so much for supporting this event. It means the world to everybody who works on this project. Um, you guys are the best and the most loyal fans, and um, thank you. And now I'm going to break your heart. Because <laughs> this question is, well, it's not that tough. Could, I don't know, it might be tough. Okay, we've, we've already discussed what is to be had here. Two express passes with a mission <laughs> to Halloween Horror Nights and a behind-the-scenes tour with me, if you can arrange it with my schedule. <laughs> I'm on limited time. The question. Okay, get ready. Nobody yell it out. If you yell it out, that thing gets shredded. Okay? <laughs> Counting the upcoming maze The Bride of Frankenstein Lives, how many HHM mazes has Slash composed an original score for? I saw yours first. Oh. Got, got to think about it. Okay. That is not correct. Right here. Let's, okay, well, let's find out. First one, 2014, Clowns 3D. That's one. 2018, Universal Monsters. That's two. Who said three? That's two. <laughs> 2019, Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. 
2021, The Bride of Frankenstein Lives. The correct answer is this is our fourth collaboration on Halloween Horror Nights. So, I will give you this. Do not sell it on eBay. It becomes null and void.